So we come to this um, letter then this morning. Let's just bow again briefly in prayer before we uh, approach the themes of this letter. So Father, as we come now to your word, we pray that you would quieten our hearts, still our minds, and help us, Lord, for this brief time to focus on the word of God. We pray, Lord, that we may leave this place having been spiritually fed by the Holy Spirit, encouraged, lifted up, Lord, with renewed vigour, to live for and to serve you, we pray. Amen. Now, what do we know about Colossae? It was uh, a fairly significant town in the Roman Empire of the time, in the River Lycus Valley. Um, it was an important colony. It was very mixed. There were Jews, Gentiles of all descriptions and nations present there. It was an important trading town. Um, but it's beginning to lose its importance a little bit because the main road uh, had bypassed Colossae. I know today there are lots of campaigns, aren't there, to have bypasses for, for towns. But in those days, um, that meant that trade in the town would begin um, to decrease, and perhaps we see the same today. So does that mean then that in one sense it was insignificant and uh, so didn't really deserve to be visited with the gospel? Well, of course not. And uh, although Paul hasn't actually visited the Colossians, he writes to them because he's heard about them. He's heard of them from this man, Epaphras, there in verse 7 of chapter 1, whom Paul describes as a faithful minister of Christ. It was Epaphras who took the gospel there, perhaps on his way to visit Paul in Rome. We don't really know. But right at the end of um, the letter, Paul writes again concerning this man, Epaphras. So if you turn right to the end, chapter 4, and verse 12, we get a little bit more information about him. We read in verse, four, uh, verse 12 of chapter 4, Epaphras, who is one of you. So looks like he was, uh, had some definite connection with Colossae. A bondservant of Christ greets you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has a great zeal for you and those who are in Laodicea and those in Hierapolis. And they were towns not too far from Colossae in the Lycus Valley. So this man is clearly an exceptional uh, servant. He's an exceptional Christian um, in terms of the way in which he approaches his work. Um, and he is also an exceptional prayer and is praying for this um, church that he's well acquainted with. And he comes to Paul with news. Not only have the Colossians received the message, the word of God, but they have, many of them have believed it, and they become Christians. Now, does that mean that they've simply had a change of mind? Um, and they listened to Epaphras, and they thought, well, this man seems to have a pretty good argument, a good way of living, I think I'll, um, I think I'll become a Christian. Or maybe others uh, might think that, well, um, perhaps he presented the gospel in a particularly modern and attractive way, and uh, that was attractive to these Colossians. And so they decided that maybe it was a good thing to become a Christian. But the truth of the matter is that it was God who worked through Epaphras as he preached about the Lord Jesus Christ who changed their hearts. They were born again as they trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not simply a mental assent when someone becomes a Christian. It's not something that you might fancy to do today, as it were, and then forget about in two or three weeks time. Oh yeah, well, a few weeks ago I said I'd be a Christian, but all that seems to have died away a bit. Something has taken root 
in the hearts of these Colossians and it has changed them. Change them fundamentally inside out and that's by the grace of God. That is by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is by the working of the Holy Spirit in the heart of these people and he has changed them. We read of their progress in the faith. We see that uh, Paul particularly thanks God for the Colossians and is always praying for them because we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints. So their profession of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ was matched by their service and their love for their fellow Christians and of course for those outside the church whom they sought to share the gospel with. They have a hope in heaven, Paul says in chapter 1, verse 5, which is laid up for them. And that hope came through the preaching of the gospel as they trusted the Lord Jesus. This gospel is bearing fruit across the world. And because of that, Paul is so thankful that he wants to write to them and to encourage them and to help them in the faith even though he's not been able to go to them he's in prison he can't physically go to them though i'm sure he would have loved to have gone but he can pray and we read in verse 9 this wonderful prayer what is it that they're praying what is it you pray for for your christian brothers and sisters at that prayer meeting this week well there in verse 9 and 10 paul speaks that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. I wonder, friends, if we started praying for each other fervently like that, what changes we might see in our churches. And notice what Paul says in verse 11. This might, this power that's come from the Lord Jesus to change these people is for what? He says it's for patience and long-suffering and joy. The Christian is called to walk with the Lord Jesus and that requires patience and long-suffering. Now you might say to me, well, just I'm just interested to know a little bit more about this born-again phrase. You hear it bandied around a lot today, don't we, by um, so-called evangelical Christians. So, so what does it actually mean? Well, Paul goes on to explain. Verse 13, he says, he has delivered us from the power of darkness. So what does that mean? It means that the Colossians, before they became Christians, were in the dark. They were in darkness. In fact, they belonged to the king of the kingdom of darkness, Satan. They didn't know it, though. They thought that daily life was much as should normally be. They went about their duties and uh, carried on until this man Epaphras came and preached to them and told them about the Lord Jesus Christ. And their eyes were opened. And they realized their perilous state. As Paul writes in chapter 3 about the wrath of God which is coming on the sons of disobedience. Chapter 3 verse 6. What does that mean? It means that Epaphras warned these Colossians that in their current state of sin, because of their disobedience and the way they were living, which was contrary to God's law, that God's day of wrath was going to come and it would burst upon their heads and it will burst upon the head of anyone who lives in the way Paul describes there in chapter 3 verse 5 in disobedience to God which is bad news for all of us because we are all by nature like those Colossians were before they became Christians. But Paul uh, writes to them, he says that through the Lord Jesus, through the preaching of the gospel, God has delivered us from the power of darkness. He's done what we could not. 
He's broken the chains. He's opened the dungeon door. He's conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love. So a Christian is now in a different kingdom. He's in the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. He or she are in that kingdom. And in that kingdom, if you're a Christian, we read, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. So all those things that the Colossians were doing that they thought was pretty normal, they began to see was actually sinful. And that the only way to have those sins forgiven was through faith in Christ. And that because Jesus shed his blood on the cross, forgiveness was possible. They began to see for the first time just how horrific sin is. It required the death of the Son of God, the shedding of his blood, to make a way possible for us to have our sins forgiven. That's how serious it is. Who is this Jesus then, you might say to me? You know, you, well, I've got, I don't know, I don't know we, we, uh, we support the work of Sazra at Providence Naphill and we had uh, one of their uh, representatives come a few weeks ago to talk to us about the work, particularly the opportunities they have with, with new conscripts. And he just shared some of the thoughts people had about Jesus. One person said, isn't that Father Christmas? Another person said, I've never heard of him. Others thought they were some kind of angel or some kind of mythic beast. So who is he? He is the image of the invisible God, Paul says, the firstborn over all creation. That doesn't mean he was created. It means that he has preeminence over all God's creation. In fact, Paul says... By him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth. And as the Colossians listened to Epaphras, they realized, well, that must mean me. That must mean God made me. And if he made me, I need to be living a life that's pleasing to him. But I'm not. That's who Jesus is. Everything in all of creation, not just on this earth, but throughout the entire cosmos, was made through him, for him, and by him. All things were created through him and for him, Paul says. He is before all things, and in him all things consist. That means you and me, the air we breathe. Without his power, it would collapse. Some of you know I'm interested in astronomy and I was reading a, a review of a book about how this particular distinguished academic thought the universe was going to end. And in it she says, well, we human beings are, we're insignificant beings and this is what's going to happen. Maybe you'll hear something about that in the meeting later today. Things are going to fall apart. Jesus holds it together. And it will not be until he decides that that day of wrath is coming that things will change. We aren't in a universe that's determined by random chance or the throw of a dice. We are in a universe made by the Lord Jesus and for his glory. And all things are working to that end. And the Colossians heard this. They thought, well, I've never heard anything like this before. It put all the Roman deities to shame. All the religions and philosophies that they had heard, and by um, no mistake about it, there were plenty around in Colossae, put them to shame. There was nothing like this. Their ears tingled as they heard the message, and their hearts warmed, and their eyes opened, and they began to see who Jesus is. Have you, my friend? Have you seen that? And then Paul speaks about the church. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have preeminence. It's through Jesus the church has come into existence. And some people might say, yeah, but okay, but what about this thing about Jesus being God and, and man? How, how, does, how does that work? 
And the Colossians were actually being troubled by philosophies. We're not quite sure exactly what it was that was troubling them, but Paul is writing against them. Possibly some kind of mysticism, certainly tied up with the Jewish faith. Um, maybe some sort of uh, view that things physical were evil, and it was only spiritual things that were good. And Paul had heard this, and he's writing... And it, that, you know, that thinking's around today, isn't it? Oh, well, uh, I like the teaching of Jesus about morality, but forget the bit about the fact that he's the son of God. Well, you can't have one without the other. So, Paul goes on. It pleased the Father that in him, that is Jesus, all the fullness should dwell, the full power of God, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. This made forgiveness possible for the Colossians. But it also means that this universe is going to be renewed. It is broken and fallen because of sin. We don't have far to look to see that, do we? It's going to be reconciled. It's going to be made new by this same Lord Jesus Christ. And again, Paul goes on to speak of their uh, to the Colossians in verse 21 you were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death yes he had a real human body and yes he really did die on the cross he didn't faint he didn't swoon he wasn't stolen he died on the cross in case you have any doubts about that, John writes in his gospel that he actually saw a Roman soldier put a spear in Jesus' side just to make sure he was dead. Because they didn't break his bones. Like they did the other two either side of Jesus on the cross so they couldn't hold themselves up and keep breathing. Jesus was already dead. But just to make sure, a spear was thrust into his side. And he says to the Colossians, you have to continue in this faith. It's not a, a big bang that starts and that's it. You have to walk with Jesus if you're a Christian every day. Don't be moved away from the hope of the gospel. This is what these philosophers were trying to do with the Colossians. They were trying to woo them away. They were talking about angels in chapter 2, verse 18. Let no one cheat you, Paul says, of your reward, the Christian reward, that is life in heaven, taking delight in false humility and worship of angels. And it seems that this teaching involved the worship of angels. Now, I, my mum sadly passed away or passed a glory in March, thankful to God that she was a believer. But if you visit Glastonbury, which I don't recommend, but if you do and you go through the town, you will find shops selling angels. In fact, you might even see someone walking up and down the high street who claims to be an angel. And people take these things home and they worship them. Well, why worship an angel that God's created and not the creator himself? Paul says, you don't be deceived by this. This religious mumbo jumbo, this new ageism. It's a false humility, the worship of angels. This so-called inner knowledge that these mystics had. Well, you need this special knowledge. You need this special way. That's the way to follow. And Paul says, no, no, no. You follow Jesus Christ. That's the one you have to follow. And you need to continue in that faith. Perhaps you think the Christian faith is a bit of a mystery. You might say, well, you know, um, don't you have to do this? Don't you have to do that? Don't you have to do the other thing? You have to believe in Jesus Christ. That's the essential thing. Paul goes on in uh, chapter 2 to talk about other religious things that people teach about today, which he calls the basic principles of the world, the uh, empty philosophy, chapter 2, verse 8 empty to seat the tradition of men according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. 
Colossians are being swayed, they're being moved. Some of them are beginning to think, well, you know, we, we need to do this as well. We need to, we need to follow that ceremony as well. We, we, need to, we need to avoid that kind of food and that kind of drink. Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, verse 21 of chapter 2. Verse 23 says, These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, false humility and neglect of the body, but they are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. They can't save you. Can't. Whatever you do with food, drink, ceremonies, it's just on the outside. What Paul is speaking out here is a new heart. A fundamental change by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he goes on to speak a little bit more about the implications of this. Verse 6 of chapter 2, As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. How do you live the Christian life? You walk with Jesus. It's as simple as that. Because he's a living saviour. Walk in Jesus. Be rooted and built up in him. Established in the faith. As you've been taught. Abounding with thanksgiving. And then again in verse 8. Uh, we've just mentioned Paul warns against this mystic philosophy. It also taught that perhaps Jesus wasn't all he was cracked up to be. If I may reverently say that. Paul says in verse 9, refutes that, in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. No ifs, no buts. He is the Son of God. He is the exact representation of God, the writer of the Hebrews tells us. And verse 10, just wow. What do you, what do, you do with verse 10? Paul says to these Colossians, you just don't need this other stuff. You don't need it. Because you're complete in the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything that you need as a Christian is provided by him as you walk with him. You're complete in him. And he is the head of all principalities and powers. Yes, he's the head of angels. They serve him. And in verse 11 to verse 14, let's have a little look at that. Verse 13, you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. That's a phrase Paul uses to talk about the evil things the Colossians were doing. They were dead. You say, oh, come on. <laughs> yeah, they were dead, spiritually dead. Until God spoke to them through Epaphras, the gospel message of life in Jesus Christ. Paul says, in you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. All of them. Yes, past, present and future. Why? Because in verse 14, he has wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. All those times we've broken God's law, countless, countless times. What has Jesus done? He has wiped it out. On the cross, he's wiped it out. He's nailed it. He nailed redemption on the cross. What happened there? What about these principalities and powers? We talked earlier about this kingdom of darkness that Satan rules over. What happened on the cross? You might say, oh, come on, Mr. Preacher. You know, everybody knows that the cross was a complete disaster for the Christians, wasn't it? What happened on the cross? Verse 15, Paul says, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them. Triumph triumphing over them in it, i.e. the cross. On the cross, my friends, the tables were turned. Satan and his cohorts, the kingdom of darkness, thought that they'd managed at last 
to finish off God's plan by persuading wicked men to crucify the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the last we'll see of him. <laughs> On the third day, he rose from the dead, never more to die, witnessed by hundreds of disciples who, whom Jesus appeared. It's an amazing thing, isn't it? That the most spectacular triumph God has ever wrought in this entire universe was wrought as his son was crucified on the cross. My friend, if that power in the cross enabled countless men and women and boys and girls to become Christians, to have their sins forgiven, when that was Jesus, as I can put it, at his weakest, it was also God at his most powerful. He turned that around. You can't outwit him. He achieved his purpose. He disarmed the principalities and powers. He shed his blood for the forgiveness of sins. He rose on the third day for our justification, Paul says. A public demonstration of the resurrection of Jesus Christ when the angel came and rolled the stone away of that tomb which the women couldn't move. I mean, you know, this story, well, the disciples came and stole away the body. Oh, yeah, with the Roman God out the front. Oh, yeah, that was really happening, wasn't it? And the women, oh, well, they must have stolen the body. They couldn't move the stone. But they looked in the tomb, and it was empty. There was no body there. Jesus was raised from the dead, and he reigns in heaven. And make no mistake, my friend, all things are now working to his cosmic timetable. The dawning of that great day when he returns in glory to restore all things, to take his people, all Christians, these Colossian believers, Paul, Epaphras, countless millions, the Bible says can't be numbered, by humankind anyway, bringing them to heaven. That day is going to come. Are you ready? Are you ready? When you stand before the one who can see into your heart and knows everything you ever did, are you ready? What are you going to do with your sin if you still have it then? If Jesus hasn't taken it away, as we've been thinking about in this letter, what's he going to do with it? You're going to be punished for it, my friend, forever. Finally, a little bit more about how we should live. Chapter 3. For the Christian, he or she has been raised with Christ to new life. And we now focus on where he is, heaven. That's where our bank account is. That's where our heart should be. That's where our treasure is, in heaven. The hope that we have laid up for us, Paul says at the beginning of this letter. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you die. That's what, you become a Christian, yeah, you're going to have to die. So all your ambitions, all your schemes... You now have a new Lord, Jesus Christ, and our lives are now at his disposal and disposition. But that's a wonderful thing. Because the, the Bible says that God then works for good in all our circumstances to bring us to glory. Satan's lie is to say, you know what, sin's far more enjoyable, isn't it, Adam and Eve? You, you know, if you take that fruit and eat it, you're not going to die. And we've been living with the consequences of that lie ever since. So Paul writes as to how the Colossians now should live. To put away their former way of life. The way they used to live. Verse 8, I won't read it again, but the things that they thought were every day. Everybody swears, don't they? Everybody blasphemes. Everyone tells coarse jokes. What's wrong with that? It's contrary to walking with Jesus. That's what's wrong with it. 
So Paul says, put on the new man, that is, walk with Jesus. Be holy. Put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, verse 12. Bearing with one another and forgiving one another. My word. Forgiving one another. You got a grudge against someone? Have you met someone who's life has been eaten away because of something that happened years ago that they have never forgiven if anyone has a complaint against another even as Christ forgave you so you also must do but above all these things put on love which is the bond of perfection and let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which you also were called in one body and be thankful. In today's environment, there are many people, my friends, who don't have any peace. They live every day in terror of what's going to come through the front door. But for the Christian, the worst thing that can happen is actually the best. If we die, we go to glory. Paul says, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. In the Psalms we read that in the sight of God, the death of his saints is precious. Why is that? Because they're going to him. Is this how we're living here at Spring Road? Is this the mark of the fellowship? Is this the evidence of love that Paul has heard about from the Colossians that's been demonstrated? Epaphras writes to them, he says, you should know what's going on in Colossae, Paul. Yes, they've got their problems, but... Look at the way they're living, their love for Christians. Can, is the same thing being said of Spring Road, of Knapp Hill, Providence? Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in his psalms, hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Well, we have to sing in our hearts at the moment, don't we? Because we can't sing outwardly, but we can sing in our hearts. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. We didn't read the last section of chapter 3, but I just want to look at verse 23. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. Is your job dragging you down? Is your, are your studies becoming boring? Are you? I'm going to face that teacher next time I'm back at college or school. Whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. You have a new master, if you're a Christian, a new Lord, and you're working for him. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. What a privilege to serve the one who made the universe can there be any greater service I don't think so not only did he make the universe but he gave himself on the cross that we could serve him and be transferred into his kingdom to walk with him what a wonderful gospel we have no wonder he's Colossians <laughs> they were changed they were changed Yes, they had their problems. People were coming along saying, oh, you need this, you need that. And Paul saying, no, you don't. You need to walk with Christ. Friends, I commend this short letter to you. If you haven't read it for a while, perhaps today, just sit down and take a few moments. Just read through it. And for yourself, gain some of those spiritual treasures if you're a Christian. If you're not a Christian, read through it and see what it means to you. And may I encourage you to put your faith in Christ, to trust in him, to turn to him, so that you too can serve the Lord of the universe. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you.